this is the first EHS forum that I'm presentation of the year. Um, and several of the speakers in EHS 411 will be from the Medical Toxicology Program, which co-sponsors this uh, series. And our first speaker today is actually a Molecular Toxicology faculty member, Dr. Suzanne Paulson. And we're very pleased to have her here to give her presentation. Dr. Paulson is in, a professor in the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences at UCLA. She's the director of the UCLA Center for Clean Air and she's a member of the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. And Dr. Paulson received her uh, PhD, a bachelor's in chemistry from the University of Colorado, a PhD in environmental engineering science from Caltech, and then she joined the UCLA Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences, where she, as I mentioned, is currently a professor. And Dr. Paulson's talk is titled the Tangled World of Reactive Oxygen Species, the Search for the Bad Actors and Ambient Particles. Thank you very much, Dr. Hankinson, for that introduction. Um, so, this is a list of, of uh, I can barely see this. Uh, the students who did, students and postdocs who did the work, and I'll tell you a little bit more about them at the end. Um, so by way of a little bit of introduction, uh, or a little bit of an outline so you know where we're going, first of all, there's going to be an introduction. The introduction is, is uh, pretty long um, because I realize some of you students are um, not that familiar with the topic. So we'll talk a tiny bit about health effects of particulate pollution, about what reactive oxygen species are, assays to measure them, and metal solubility, and related topics. And then I'm going to tell you a bunch of results from some field campaigns that we've done, um, making measurements of particles in ambient air in a couple of locations in California, um, including using the uh, dicad 3 tall assay, measuring ice formation by the particles, hydrogen peroxide, and a bunch of other related um, species, and then finally conclusions and acknowledgments. So I promise this is by far the busiest slide I have in my talk. Um, it has a crazy amount of information in it, and it is um, from a 2012 study by something near 200 epidemiologists where they tried to rank all of the different um, causes for death around the world. Uh, our own Beata Ritz was, was in that list of authors. Um, basically, it shows the different regions around the world and the most important risk factor for, for uh, death. And uh, most of the causes, leading causes of death are things like high blood pressure and, and smoking and uh, diet-related issues and being overweight, etc. cetera. But um, in terms of environmental pollutants, Number one in that category and number three on the list overall is air pollution from solid fuels being burned in, in households. That's not happening in um, the developed world to a significant extent, but in the developing world, dirty fuels are used to cook and heat, and um, it has tremendous health consequences. Um, by far the most um, important sort of environmental uh, pollutant that we're familiar with is ambient particulate matter pollution. Um, that ranks number nine overall with a significant, a significant factor in, in high income North America. It's number 14, um, number four in East Asia and so on. So, um, so this is actually the title of the paper and the authors, et cetera. But, um, so indoor air pollution comes in at number three, outdoor particulate air pollution number nine. The next sort of environmental um, health threat is unimproved sanitation at number 25. Ambient ozone is number 39. Obviously, where you are matters tremendously and which ones are, are more important, and ozone is, is quite important here. We're not, I'm not going to talk about that, but we're not scheduled to meet the ozone standard until like 2040 or something, so we're certainly not done with that. Yes, sir. I just want to make a comment on the ozone. The reason that it's lower is it's based on a paper that I wrote that only identifies respiratory mortality, not cardiovascular. Oh. Respiratory is only about 8% of the total cardiovascular, is about 
Okay. So we have a lot of data linking particular air pollution to cardiovascular disease, but not always. But we just published a paper this year showing a link to cardiovascular disease, so I expect it's going to move way up. Okay. So there you are. So. Yeah, this is uh, Professor Jarrett, if you don't know him. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, and yeah, I'm not an epidemiologist. This is sort of general context. Yes, I'm 100% sure there are lots of, there's lots of debates about a lot of those rankings and for lots of good reasons, I'm sure. But just to sort of um, point out that this is um, certainly an important public health threat. Um, okay, so reactive oxygen species, just to define them, um, the ones that, reactive oxygen species is a term that is commonly used in um, biological systems and in liquid phase systems, not so much in the gas phase, um, but it includes things like superoxide, O2 dot minus, hydrogen peroxide, and OH, those are the ones that we're most interested in for this talk. It also includes other things like um, like HO2, organic hydroperoxides, and a few other species. Um, these, these three species certainly rapidly interchange with one another. Um, so, in, so, so reactive oxygen species are um, related to inflammation, and um, where there's a lot of inflammation, there tends to be a lot of reactive oxygen species. And um, there are many health endpoints that are associated with um, inflammation and potentially with reactive oxygen species. Um, different health outcomes may certainly be sensitive to different forms of ROS. This is also a little bit more outside the area, so maybe some of the faculty want to expand on this point too. Um, but, um, but in terms of ROS, there is an interesting interplay and not very well understood interplay between exogenous sources of reactive oxygen species, um, which is what I'm going to focus on, and endogenous sources, so, so um, tissues produce ROS in response to pollutants and injury and various, um, various things, um, and uh, particles when they're inhaled also appear to be able to generate their own ROS, and these things interact in, in ways that are um, that can influence, well, certainly the exogenous sources seem to be able to influence the endogenous sources potentially through this pathway, but the sort of relative amounts of these things is not well understood at all. So um, I'm focusing on the exogenous ROS, and um, that can also be divided. Anything can be divided into lots of different things, right? But I'm going to divide it into two things, the, the fast prompt ROS, which is the reactive oxygen species that are present in the particles when they're inhaled, and then the stuff that's generated potentially once they're inhaled and they're in lung lining fluid, for example. Um, this, the relative amounts of these things is not very well understood either, although it is clear that um, from some earlier work that, that our group did, that um, the particles contain very little things, very little hydrogen peroxide in them when they're inhaled compared to what they generate in solution. Um, and this is probably also true for, for other things like OH, but for things like organic hydroperoxides, there may be more of that. I'll talk a tiny bit more about that. Um, okay, so the things that produce ROS in particles um, is also a topic of debate. And um, from epidemiological studies, there have been um, various studies that have shown that obviously PMS is associated with health outcomes. There have also been some studies that show that um, things like sulfate um, is associated with adverse health outcomes, not necessarily ROS. Um, but sulfate is just, you know, it's acidic, it's an acid, right? But it's not really that specifically toxic. Um, so, you know, it's a candidate, but, you know, sort of a maybe, <laughs> um, probably not that serious of a candidate. Um, <laughs> and there are uh, <laughs> other things like um, nitrate and ammonium. And um, these are probably also sort of in similar categories, like there have been a lot of focus on things like those, but, but like these candidates, I don't know why your geopolitics is, but that's, uh, 
That's Boris Johnson and David Cameron. Their political careers completely exploded a few months ago as a result of Brexit. Um, so they're kind of a thing of the past. Um, so nitrate ammonium, you know, I don't know, maybe sodium chloride. I mean, all the, yeah, these things are probably don't have the sort of toxic power of some of the other things. Um, right, so candidates that didn't go quite so far. Um, so transition metals, particularly iron, copper, and manganese, are present at reasonably high concentrations and can redox cycle, so they're pretty likely to be involved in reactive oxygen species formation because they can do redox chemistry in more than once. Um, quinones, there's certainly some evidence in the literature for those. Ultrafine particles, otherwise known as UFP, um, maybe. Water-soluble organic carbon, there's sort of uh, a sort of growing pile of evidence for water-soluble organic carbon. Other unknown organics, things like ROH. Um, so these are sort of the more, uh, well, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> potent candidates, I guess. Um, and probably the ones we need to take more seriously in the end, much as we might have liked other outcomes, I'm sure, some of you. Um, all right, so, um, so measuring exogenous ROS, there are, um, it turns out, got kind of a, dizzying array of assays for measuring ROS that's formed by particles. And um, so it's an interesting kind of science sociology phenomenon. There are um, a few assays that were developed by biologists, um, including the dithiothreatol assay, DTT, and dichlorofluorescein. And these have been adopted by atmospheric chemists to some degree, as well as some of the other assays. Um, and and some of them are not, well, to say the least, they're not particularly well understood. So, so the biologists have been doing some of them, the atmospheric chemists have been doing some of them, and the state of sort of understanding of really what's going on and the important factors is, should, needs to be advanced, I guess. So, um, so in the data that I'm going to show you, we're measuring OH and OH formation and dithiothreatol consumption and hydrogen peroxide concentrations we're measuring OH using a, a method um, called terephthalate. Um, we, measure, we react OH, basically put in excess of terephthalate, it reacts with OH and it makes a product that is fluorescent. So fluorescence means you can measure it at quite low concentrations. Fluorescence methods tend to be quite sensitive. Um, OH is the most reactive ROS. It's directly um, able to react and oxidize lipids, damage DNA, oxidize proteins. Um, we're also measuring hydrogen peroxide with a horseradish peroxidase method. Um, hydrogen peroxide is, is a tricky thing because um, in this assay, we're actually measuring the concentration at a particular time. And so it's kind of in steady state. And, and uh, so it turns out to be quite a bit different from the other assays. Um, and dithiothreatol consumption, dithiothreatol, this molecule, is thought to uh, mimic biological reductants react directly with ROS generating PN components um, and uh, yeah, but, but basically overall its chemistry is not completely understood. Um, the other people also use things like ascorbic acid consumption. Ascorbic acid is an antioxidant present in lung fluids, so it has sort of direct physiological relevance in terms of how the body deals with particles when it, they're inhaled. Um, it both reacts with OH and it can react with some of the metals. Um, also, electron paramagnetic residence, dichlorofluorescein, um, DCFH, dichlorofluorescein is kind of uh, similar in some ways to DTT in that it reacts to a number of things um, with varying responses. Um, okay, there are other people that, I'm, that I'm, I, can't, I think I'm jealous of. Um, I'm certainly impressed by. They actually managed to grow cells in little wells and expose particles to them. And um, interestingly, students in my lab are, are, are very interested in some of these assays, and some of them are threatening to bring in cells, which I'm terrified by, but, um, but you know, maybe it'll happen. I don't know. But, um, but this is one example where people have actually managed to grow, um, potentially, actually I'm not sure if this paper did, but there are groups that have managed to grow lung epithelial cells and have macrophages in there, um, growing little cells and then exposed cells to them. The, um, 
you know, obviously there are some biological re higher biological relevance for this situation, but it's not a, a system that you can go out and make lots of measurements in ambient air and, and try and, um, you know, connect with epidemiological studies or anything like that. So there are definitely trade-offs. Um, okay, this, and this is just one more assay that one of my students has actually gotten to work in the lab, although certainly not with all that stuff. Um, so, so he's basically got an assay to work to look at um, lipid oxidation in um, bronchoalveolar um, lavage fluid. Um, so so uh, brave volunteers allow their lungs to be washed out and a bunch of the lipids come out. And um, he can and measure the oxidation of those with this thing called the T-bars assay, um, which I don't have any results from yet, but he's just got to work. So um, there are also, in addition to there being in the literature, lots of different assays, there are also lots of different extraction solutions. And um, in our studies, we mostly use the stuff that we're calling simulated lung fluid, and it consists of pH 7.4 adjusted with phosphate, some salt, and several lung antioxidants at physiologically relevant concentrations, um, and some citrate to mimic the activity of proteins chelating uh, metals. Um, I'm also going to show you some results from concentrated phosphate buffer from lung lavage fluid, which is what's going on here and also water at pH 3.5 because I am in an atmospheric science department and um, so I should be interested in what's going on in the environment, fog drops and particles and stuff, which I certainly am, but um, I'm not going to talk about that too much today. So um, this is just, this is mostly the effect of pH, but also other things. So this is um, Samples that were collected in Claremont and Fresno in California, and I'll tell you a little bit more about those, what's different about those samples in a bit. But um, they're extracted in water at pH 3.5 in simulated lung fluid, which is most of the data I'm going to show you, in bronchial alveolar lavage fluid. But each of these pairs of bars is from a different patient, so if they don't totally agree with each other, that's why. Um, and phosphate buffer. And so phosphate buffer and simulated lung fluid are at the same pH, but the simulated lung fluid has the antioxidants, and the antioxidants interact with metals. Um, and in this case, we're looking at um, sort of bioavailable iron, which I'll tell you what that is, too, in a minute. But you can see that um, the antioxidants more than double the um, amount of iron that's solubilized. So, um, so that's important. This, um, the difference between pH 3.5 and phosphate buffer is mostly the pH effect. So iron is much more soluble at low pH. And um, so, so different studies use different extraction solutions. So there's a lot of different results as a result. Um, this is um, similar data also from our field studies for copper. It turns out that copper is quite soluble and it's not so sensitive to the extraction solution. Um, we're actively doing some more measurements on, on this thing, trying to understand um, how the different metals are solubilized in the different solutions, but that's what I have to show you right now. Um, this shows also the effect of uh, antioxidants on okay, um, the OH assay. So these are results from some of my colleagues at, at UC Davis. And what they did is look at um, OH formation, actually measured a slightly different way, but whatever, um, with no antioxidants in the solution. And they saw very little activity across the board. They add ascorbate, huge increase in activity um, for copper and somewhat less for iron. Also, vanadium shows up. You add citrate, and instead of copper being the leading one, iron becomes more important. And then glutathione and uric acid don't do a lot. But um, the antioxidants mean that the, to really change the activity of the metals a lot. Um, unfortunately, the metal responses and in some cases the quinones are also kind of nonlinear, um, which is another problem with a lot of the assays. Sort of, this has just recently been recognized. Um, how important this is. It turns out it's, it's quite important for the DTT assay, not so important in OH for whatever reason. But um, so 
So it is a, certainly a complicated system. Um, this shows mass dependence of DTT, the DTT response, and you see a very, very strong, clear mass dependence for the DTT response. Um, my colleagues in Davis figured out a correction for that so that they can um, get rid of that problem of basically the amount of particles that you put in your extraction solution in that case. Um, it turns out that fortunately for us, OH and um, OH is not so sensitive to mass, so we don't have such a problem. For some reason, it's, it's really strong in the DTC assay, but not so much in the other assays. There's a little bit of evidence for it in some of our data, but it's overall not too bad. Um, hydrogen peroxide, it's who knows what. It's just all over the place, but it's not a very strong effect anyway, um, like the DTT assay. Okay, so then which assay is best? Well, it kind of depends on what you're trying to do with it, but um, I think that the the goal is to have a reliable and not too expensive assay to test PM toxicity in a way that's actually relevant um, and also advance the understanding of PM toxicity, figure out where to focus controls. So ultimately, actually in, in Sacramento, um, which is where the California Air Resources Board is and where um, ambient air policy is set in California, and, um, and then, by the way, since California leads the nation by far in air quality control and it has special status under the Clean Air Act, typically the rest of the country will kind of follow, at least pay a lot of attention to what's going on in California. So what we do in California is really important, not just to us, but to um, the rest of the country and to some degree to the rest of the world. Um, there are lots of people in, in uh, Lots of people, some people in Sacramento think we should just control aerosol mass and not worry about if there's some small components that are super toxic. So this is one of the questions that I'm going to have as a little bit of a theme. Um, but so ideally a useful cell-free assay would be able to mimic in vitro and in vivo toxicity. Um, but really we haven't, there hasn't been a lot of real comparisons between these, in, these cell free assays and toxicity, as in toxicology. Um, they should also be consistent with epidemiological results identifying which PM components and sources are linked to human health effects. So there's a lot of confusion there in the literature. Unfortunately, the epi, epi results don't give a consistent picture. Um, there are different sources that get identified and different components that have been identified. Um, and while I think that certainly transition metals are rising to the top and organic carbon are rising to the top, there's still a lot of, um, a lot of uncertainty. Um, and doing an actual epi study relating an assay or several assays is um, kind of currently out of reach, but I will show you the results of one attempt to do that. And this was done by, um, so, so the Environmental Protection Agency funded some big centers um, that just finished a couple years ago, um, or like a year ago. And, um, and there was one at Georgia Tech and Emory together, and they had a whole bunch of people working on this, and what they did was they estimated um, historical, so they backcasted with a model what would have been the diethyl-3-etol response and um, so they calculated the PM concentrations and their chemical components and then tried to estimate the DTT response and also the um, ascorbic acid consumption. That's another assay that they tried to backcast um, for several Georgia sites um, over a 10 year or so period. And then they did epidemiological analysis of the relationships between calculated DTT and AA for data that they had for um, emergency department visits, for asthma wheeze, and congestive heart failure. And they found um, slightly significant results for the DTT assay, um, but not for ascorbic acid, and not for PM mass either, actually. Um, these, are, these are kind of typical, the, the um, air pollution effects tend to produce small or moderate effects in many different sort of disease outcomes. Um, there are some uncertainties in this study. Unfortunately, the regression um, measured between the estimated DTT rates for 2012-2013, for which they actually had measurements, so they had measurements for the current time and the model, 
um, was only 0.45, so you know certainly significant, but not a not a super strong correlation. Um, and then there's additional uncertainty due to the apparent dependence of the DTT response on the PM mass in the assay. Um, so yeah, so there we are. Okay, tiny bit about prompt ROS. There's been not a lot done on this except for um, I guess I mentioned earlier our, our earlier work, um, which I don't have a slide on that shows that things like hydrogen peroxide and OH in the particles when they're inhaled is relatively low compared to what they generate once they're captured. Um, but there are some other measurements that are going on at um, University of Cambridge where I was hanging out last year on sabbatical. Um, and they have been able to show using a, the dichlorofluorescein assay that um, when they generate secondary organic aerosol in a flow tube in the lab, um, there is quite high activity initially and it rapidly decays away. Um, we also know that signals uh, do, that's, that, that prompt stuff goes away in a few minutes. This is over days to, I don't know, hours, days, months. Um, the activity does decay with time slowly. Also, a lot of studies in the literature have been done on particles that have been frozen for years or stored some way for years. Um, okay, so on to the field campaigns. Um, so we did two, we did a field study at two sites. One of them was in Claremont, so we are like right over here right now, um, right by the ocean. And um, in LA, on a typical smoggy day, and a, which would also be a sunny day, there's a sea breeze that brings air from the ocean across what we call the air basin and collects a whole bunch of um, pollutants all along the way. And as it goes along, there are a bunch of chemical reactions that produce secondary organic aerosols and ozone and nitrate and other stuff. So we picked a site in um, that would be considered a receptor site at Harvey Mudd College in Claremont. And um, we made measurements during the summertime when that effect is the largest. So we're looking for secondary organic aerosol effects. And then we made some measurements in January in Fresno and it turns out that in that area, there's a lot of residential wood burning. So particularly at night, you take the sample out of the filter and it looks brown, whereas the filters in LA will look white. Um, doesn't mean they're necessarily better for you, but they're clearly visibly very different. Um, so lots of biomass burning there and very little photochemistry in the middle of January when it's cold. There was also on top of nice university buildings. Okay. So, um, so Fresno, a lot of biomass burning plus urban emissions, and Claremont, urban emissions plus photochemical stuff. Um, they're collected on various Teflon filters um, three times a day in the morning, afternoon, and overnight. Um, some of them were frozen until analysis, not ideal, but the way it was. Some of, them, some of the analyses were done on site and extracted in simulated lung fluid. Um, so again, we measured OH. We actually did that mostly on site um, within an hour or so of the filters coming out of the holders. And um, dithiothreatol and hydrogen peroxide later. We also, um, actually dithiothreatol was measured by our colleagues in Davis. Um, and quinones were measured by our colleagues at Cal State Fresno. And we also measured um, soluble transition metals with inductively coupled plasma mass spec. Um, we measured um, speciated iron that is that can be chelated by ferrazine, um, both oxidation states. And this iron is a very small fraction of the total iron that's in the sample, but it's what we're calling the bioactive sample uh, part of the iron. For lack of, I mean, we're not really sure what exactly is bioactive, but certainly this part is much much more active than the total iron. Um, we also measured brown carbon um, for the uh, Fresno samples. This is a three-dimensional um, spectrum of the fluorescence of those samples. So brown carbon is well known to absorb in the near UV and also fluoresce there and also we measured mass. Um, okay, so, um, oh dear, sorry, how do I fix this? I'll go back to that in a second. Um, okay, so do chemical components do a better job than mass at predicting ROS? 
Um, so for DTT, this is our DTT data plot, plotted versus mass for Claremont and Fresno. There's a little bit more mass in Fresno than there was in uh, Claremont. In the wintertime, um, it gets cold in Fresno, and the air gets trapped near the surface, and you tend to get high PM concentrations. Um, but if you notice, the slope is almost identical. I mean, for field data, that's really amazingly similar. And the R squares are also very good for both sites. So mass does a pretty darn good job of predicting the DTT assay. And it's the same for both sites, even though the chemical composition between these two sites is quite different, um, which is, you know, is what it is. It's interesting. Um, DTT is, in the Claremont samples, even more strongly predicted by a multivariate regression with just the soluble iron and the copper. Um, so, obviously, mass doesn't consume DTT. Something in the particle is consuming the DTT, and there's a very, very strong correlation with iron and copper. For, um, for Fresno, the biomass burning sample, just looking at the component the amount of biomass burning aerosol in the particles does as good a job as mass does. So that's a very important factor for the Fresno samples. Um, for OH, the correlations are not so good. Um, uh, for Claremont, actually, they're, they're, they're pretty good, not quite so good for Fresno. And they have very different slopes between the two sites. So Fresno is um, significantly less active, especially the afternoon samples, which have very little um, biomass burning aerosol in them. Um, they have very, very little activity. Um, and, but when there's a lot of biomass burning aerosol, which happens to be in the, in the nighttime and the morning samples, um, these guys, there's more activity. But mass is, while it's a pretty good predictor in both cases, it's a very different slope. So if you're just controlling for if you're just regulating mass, you're going to have a bigger impact in, uh, in Claremont than you will in Fresno um, if it turns out that OH is actually important in a biological, biological context. Um, so for Claremont, the OH is really well predicted primarily by soluble iron um, plus copper and manganese, and then you get a, a pretty nice correlation um, with a significantly higher R squared than you do for mass. Um, for Fresno, um, unfortunately, there's a bunch of data gaps, so I can't really do a multivariate regression. Um, the, most, the best predictor of OH formation in the Fresno samples is the amount of biomass burning aerosol. Um, uh, but it doesn't do quite, a good, quite as good a job as mass does. Hydrogen peroxide is an ungodly mass, basically. Um, and, but it is better correlated with a multivariate regression of a few of the irons, manganese, iron, and copper, which are the ones we would expect. Um, and mass is basically uncorrelated to hydrogen peroxide for Claremont. And for, um, for Fresno, Hewis also sort of organizes the data as a oh, sort of okay correlation coefficient. It's not linear. Um, and it's much better than mass. So, um, so overall, the um, mass does a remarkably good job for DPT, but not a very good job for the others. And just a couple chemical components do a better job than, um, than mass does. Um, and you notice that I told you we measured quinones. I didn't show any quinone data in there. Basically, there were no significant correlations with quinones. So, um, so that's why you haven't seen that data. OK, so do ROS assays agree with one another? Um, uh, so as you would guess, since DTT has the same slope for both places, but OH doesn't, it's going to be, there's going to be different slopes when you plot OH versus DTT um, for the two different sites. Um, and so for Claremont, interestingly, they're very tightly correlated, but something else is going on in the Fresno samples. They're not so well correlated. Um, hydrogen peroxide is really not correlated to either OH or DTT. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. So takeaway from that is the assays are different. Um, we don't you know, necessarily know which one we should use, um, but there are certainly relationships. Um, okay, sorry. 
Okay. Um, so I wanted to just look at the metals at the different sites. So this is just metals versus mass. This is copper, um, Claremont, and Fresno. Um, basically, there's similar amounts of copper at the two sites. It's quite low in the afternoon. We need to um, probably do some air mass back trajectory analysis to figure out why that is. Um, but overall, it's, it's, uh, it's slightly higher in Claremont, but, um, but not much. Um, iron is um, actually lower in the afternoons and the morning samples in Fresno, but quite high in the samples with large amounts of biomass burning Hewlis. Um, and so overall, it's sort of on average is higher, but it's not notably lower in some of the samples compared to the um, Claremont samples. Um, and you also notice that iron is actually very strongly related to mass, whereas some of the, at least in the Claremont samples, which is not the case for all of these. Um, manganese is about an order of magnitude lower in concentration than iron and copper, but um, uh, at least iron and bioavailable copper. There's a lot of other iron in the particles compared to the sort of bioavailable part. Um, so. But manganese is significantly higher in the Claremont samples than in Fresno. Um, okay, so we got quite interested in, the, in the, these effects of biomass burning helis because they seem to be quite dramatic. And um, one of my students decided that he wanted to look at, we didn't, we didn't have good biomass burning sub, um, samples that we had sort of in large enough quantities that we can really mess around with them, plus, the biomass burning that comes from the real world contains a bunch of metals in it, and that really complicates analyses if you want to look at interactions between that stuff and metals. So we used um, this stuff called Swanee River Fulvic Acid. Um, this is available from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Somebody like dredged up a bunch of river organics. Um, it's not a perfect um, stand-in, but it's pretty good. Um, it has many of the same functional groups. It's a large, complex um, organic um, with a lot of carboxylic acids and carbonyls and, and other things that are similar. Um, but biomass burning helis is a little bit smaller, has lower aromaticity and weaker acid characteristics, so it's not exactly the same. Um, but with Swanee River full of acid, we've been able to um, make some progress anyway. So, so first we did some uh, speciation modeling. This is iron being complexed by fulvic acid. I should say my student did this, I didn't do this. Um, and so this shows the distribution of iron in solution in, uh, in the simulated lung fluid. So a little more than half of it is complexed with citrate. Um, some of it is present as iron phosphate and only about 12% is free iron. And then when you add a little bit of fulvic acid, almost 95% of it is taken up by the fulvic acid, so it outcompetes the citrate. Um, and then a little bit more, and it's all taken up by um, citrate. So we also built a chemical kinetics model to describe the system to see just how close we could get. And it turns out that it, it came out pretty well. Um, so in that, in that model, we have the, some of the important reactions. So part of what's going on to produce the reactive oxygen species is um, sort of traditional Fenton chemistry where iron 2 or copper 1 will react with hydrogen peroxide, break it down, and release OH radicals. And that reaction is much faster, it seems, when the iron is complexed by fulvic acid. So, so chelators for metals can can uh, completely knock out their activity or they can enhance their activity. They can do just an enormous range depending on what the chelator is, the organic complex that's, that's grabbing onto the metal. Um, in the dark in, in our systems, um, one of the really important reactions is basically the origin of the ROS. So you've got to make the hydrogen peroxide. Um, there's a little bit present in water everywhere, but um, to get the levels that we get to, we have to make some, some reactive oxygen species. So, so this um, rather slow reaction of iron or complex iron with oxygen that's in the solution um, makes superoxide, and that's what leads to the um, OH formation ultimately. 
But um, so the iron complex, the complex iron also does this reaction faster, we believe. And then this last couple of reactions here is how you make the iron two back. Um, that's with ascorbate, which is why the antioxidants in the lung, they're there to avoid oxidation, but they do in some ways encourage oxidation. They certainly change the ROS chemistry. Um, so um, that's how you make the iron two back so you can start over again. So this shows some of the data. Um, the dotted lines are the model, and so we, we can model the increase in this is OH formation versus iron concentration at different levels of salinity river folic acid. And um, as we add more fulvic acid, we get higher OH production. This is all after two hours. Um, and the more iron also enhances that. So we can model the difference between um, 0 and 5 micrograms per uh, milliliter of fulvic acid. Beyond that, we can't model it, which, um, which seems to imply that there's um, something a little bit wrong with the complexation model and the speciation of, mo of iron, because as I showed you before, at 5 micrograms, almost all of the iron is already complex, so that means that our model is not going to be able to um, be able to reproduce when we add more than that, because it's already sort of all been taken up by the fulvic acid. But anyway, um, this is much better than I expected we would be able to do based on the state of the literature. So it's actually actually kind of excited that we can put together a chemical kinetics model and really start to work out some of the chemistry. Um, this just shows what happens when you add iron to actual biomass burning aerosol, um, since that was river dunk, basically. Um, so just just biomass burning aerosol by itself produces a bunch of OH. Just iron by itself produces a little bit more. When you put them together, then you produce even more. So this is just sort of verifying that we're, you know, mimicking something that's actually happening. So just a little bit more about um, biomass burning aerosol. I'm getting close to being done. Um, so at um, at 24 hours, so the hydrogen peroxide is really different between Claremont and Fresno, and it's quite confusing, but I've been starting to try to make sense of it a little bit. And um, so if we plot hydrogen peroxide versus iron and versus copper, there's basically no relationship here, and there's, it looks like more iron sort of destroys hydrogen peroxide, which given the Fenton reaction between hydrogen peroxide and iron is what you would expect. But then when you go to Fresno, everything's just sort of all scattered all over the place, especially for iron, um, except for these guys do look like their the iron is still kind of destroying it. They don't have a lot of biomass burning aerosol in there, a lot of hewless in there, so um, maybe they're acting kind of like they were before. Um, but then um, looking a little bit more at the copper, it does look like when there's hewless and copper, then we start to see... Um, significantly more hydrogen peroxide. So, um, and this is basically kind of uh, looking at the same thing. So, so it's kind of looking to me a little bit like the like with very little hewless, there's the iron is dominating and destroying the copper, but I mean, the hydrogen peroxide. But um, but there may be a pretty strong interaction between the copper and the hewless that's controlling some of this behavior, which is something that we'll probably look at next. Okay, so in summary for the ROS, um, this is not almost the last slide, we've got about like six more, so stay with me, all right? Um, okay, so um, DTT is pretty much the same at the two sites, especially once aerosol mass is considered. Um, OH is higher in the Claremont samples and very low in the Fresno samples unless they contain biomass burning aerosols um, from, from uh, yeah, from the OH perspective, the, the Fresno samples look pretty harmless um, as long as you get rid of the biomass burning, um, which there are some regulations to try and improve that situation that are, have been implemented in the last couple of years. Um, hydrogen peroxide is much higher in the Fresno samples where there's significant biomass burning aerosol by like a factor of 10. Um, so it's a really dramatic change in the distribution of the reactive oxygen species. 
Um, the largest differences between Fresno and Claremont, which I've already said a few times, is there's lots of biomass burning in aerosol in Fresno, it's absent in Claremont, somewhat higher copper and iron, and quite a bit higher manganese in Claremont compared to Fresno, except the samples that have high biomass burning. Um, biomass burning activity could be due to higher solubilization of available iron, higher iron content, increases in the rate of oxidant producing reactions by complex iron and other transition metals, and also there's evidence for interactions between biomass burning and copper that maybe we ought to look at. Um, I think I'm actually going to, well, maybe I'll briefly go through this. There are, there's a bunch of literature that was done large, created largely by our colleagues at UC Davis in the lab where they made very, very simplified solutions um, to try and look at some of this chemistry, and they argue basically that copper does everything, um, and as a result are actively trying to convince the state to control copper, um, which might not be a bad idea, but, um, but in the field data, that's not really what we see. Mostly what we see is that um, iron, the soluble part of iron, the sort of critical component of the iron, is dominant, um, except where there's biomass burning. Um, and when there's biomass burning hewless, then it seems to be the dominant controlling factor. And copper contributes, doesn't seem like it's good for you, but, um, but it's not as important. So a little bit of context, this is also from that Georgia Tech Emory University study. This shows, um, it's a crazy diagram, but it's, it's a lot of data. Um, I want, yeah, it's interesting way they came to, to represent it. So basically what it shows is, like for zinc, um, if it has a strong correlation with DTT, then it's a blue stripe bar, and if it's a weak correlation with DTT, it's a, just a solid blue bar. And for ascorbic acid, zinc with ascorbic acid is a gray or a black bar. So if you look for those striped blue bars, you see that DTT is kind of correlated with zinc, um, very correlated with iron, um, a little bit with manganese, not very much with copper, a lot with water-soluble organic carbon, a lot with brown carbon, a lot with PM mass, which actually is quite consistent with our results. Um, we basically found strong relationships with iron and biomass burning. AA is mostly related with copper, um, potentially because AA actually reacts directly with copper. Um, ascorbic acid. So, okay, now here are the real conclusions. Um, lots of ROS assays, lots of conditions, results depend strongly on the extraction solution and on the assay, unfortunately. Um, we're able to find relationships between RO, oh, we were not able to find relationships between ROS and quinones. Um, DTT and OH are generally well correlated with, a, with mass, but if, if uh, DT is right, DTT is right, we could just control for mass, according to these studies anyway. Um, but if OH is better, then the slopes are really different. So um, we should look at more uh, toxic components in the particles. Um, the most important things are iron, where present biomass burning aerosol, and to a less degree copper, manganese. Um, certainly, it's just a subset of the iron that's most important. Um, organics also play a really significant role by adjusting the redox activity of transition metals. Um, I think I'll skip that. And some of the major unanswered questions, what the assays are measuring, which assay is best, role of endogenous versus exogenous ROS, and the source and distribution of active iron, which is something that really hasn't been looked at at all. And finally, the people who actually did the work um, Michelle Kwong, um, in the green with the white sweater back there, Adlin Scott next to her, um, David Gonzalez, who is over there in the plaid shirt, um, this postdoc who left and, and was there for the people in the color are uh, people who are actually in the field, actually out there suffering. And then a bunch of people at Cal State Fresno, some people at UC Davis. Um, Lelia Hawkins at Harvey Mudd College who arranged for us to go on her roof with no fence and, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, it was really wonderful working there. They had so many fewer rules than we do. And, um, and support from the California Air Services Board and the National Science Foundation. So, thank you.
Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions. Oh, sorry. All right.